Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Katie Testa uh, coming in from Detroit, right? Yes. Trying to make sure? yeah. Okay, Detroit. Um, <clears throat> she's a uh, an unschooler of a nine-year-old boy, six-year-old girl, and four-year-old girl. Um, she's a voluntarist, anarchist, truth seeker, freedom fighter, nonviolent communication facilitator, and coach. Uh, she teaches uh, workshops and intensives. Um, she travels quite a bit, and and so she's associated. She's affiliated with the, the NYCNVC.org website, and and her website is uh, MD nvc.org um so we'll put all that in the uh in the description and uh, you can find her on facebook um delilah declare awesome name very cool <laughs> <laughs> and uh and her facebook page is uh, metro detroit nonviolent communication if you want to go over there give her a like because we all need more likes right everyone wants to be liked so <laughs> <laughs> so katie uh thanks a lot for coming on the show yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I first heard about you through your uh, interview with uh, Luis on his Emancipated Human. And I'm like, wow, this woman is too happy. No, just <laughs> <laughs> no it, was, it was a great... Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is just bubbling with life. And that's what we need because, you know, like we were talking about before, Anarchist has such a, you know, gloomy... Uh, connotation people will get scared of it they uh, freak out you know they're like oh you, you want like the you know people killing and raping and murdering and stealing yeah. from each other and you know that movie the purge anarchy that's what you want that, that's that what you <laughs> is that really so um it's kind of it's kind of funny it's like no actually you know i'm just a regular guy and i think that that we shouldn't rob from each other you know isn't that such a revolutionary concept right <laughs> yeah we actually want peace right Right. it's such so you, you just you're just a utopian idealistic um you know <laughs> person <laughs> so um yeah so before we get into uh to the topics um can you just go into your some of your background in you know how you became a volunteerist what influenced you you know podcast books or personalities things like that yeah, sure. Um, so I had my first child when I was pretty young, and as soon as I had him, I I wanted to really begin to understand like human development. How do people learn? How how can I help this human being thrive and just have the best life ever? And uh, so I started reading books and uh, getting really curious and uh, really enjoying just raising my baby. And um, yeah, when he Turn about two, two and a half. Family members started to ask, like, when is he going to, to go to preschool? When, when will you send him off to school? And mm -hmm. just in my heart, like, my heart just sank down into my gut, and I knew, like, that was not what I wanted to do. I really, really wanted to experience this life that I brought into the world, and and um, I I just got so much pleasure out of watching him learn and discover the world and see it all as new. Um, and I wanted that to continue, and I felt a responsibility to do that as well because I, I chose to have him. So uh, I started to research alternative education approaches. Um, homeschooling was the first thing that I, I started to Google. Um, at that point, I was still a statist, and I went to the library and checked out like every book they had on um, education, pedagogy. Uh, I read like a ton of Maria Montessori stuff and a lot of her perspectives really resonated with me but there were a couple of things that weren't quite right um, particularly her perspective on like fantasy and imaginary play uh, that this was somehow like an escape from reality and, and not helpful and I think in my observations of children it's actually a way of getting into reality and, and practicing doing what adults do and um, yeah trying to discover it in using their minds. So that did, that wasn't quite right. And then I came across uh, John Holt, which maybe you're familiar with his work. Oh, yeah. He's, oh, yeah. yeah, he's uh, the granddaddy of unschooling, yeah. uh, just a brilliant, insightful individual who um, really just shone a bright light on the nature of the educational system and the nature of it and, and the problem with coercive, uh, a coercive approach to learning or the idea that individuals kind of stuff information into and that would somehow lead to like a well-developed happy satisfied human being and um 
in my personal experience as a child in the public school system, that wasn't the case. And I, and talking to a lot of people, I, I'm hearing that, uh, you know, from, it's not just me, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, so, I, so I decided to look more into this whole idea of unschooling and I started to look into like the people who are actually doing this and um, addressing some of my fears about it. And, uh, and I, yeah, through my research, just it made sense to me and I thought that I would, I would give it a shot. And um, I haven't looked back since then. Uh, so I was already kind of a, applying the idea of freedom or liberty to my children, right? But I just hadn't universalized this idea to adults yet. And uh, at one point, I got curious about economics. And um, I actually am a high school dropout, so I didn't take any like formal econ classes, which I think could be kind of a benefit because I could look at it without any sort of biased lens. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw uh, my husband at the time, his his textbook uh, for some econ class that he took. And it was discussing leaving uh, the gold standard and like why that happened. And I was like, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. And then they just kind of glossed it over and, and moved on as if like that had no consequences or implications and the value of money and I, that didn't make sense to me so I started to google more about you know economics and um, I found Murray Rothbard and uh, yeah Mises.org and I just like devoured this information totally blew my mind open and mm -hmm. to like a new way of looking at things it made total sense to me you know that um, the non I discovered the non-aggression principle and this was already really in alignment with how I was choosing to live my life I just didn't have words to to put to it um, as practicing peaceful and attachment parenting and unschooling and uh, you know I, I had a let live let live kind of philosophy or attitude towards the, the grown adults in my life for the most part pretty much politically apathetic but um, yeah once I once I found Rothbard that kind of flipped the switch and I uh, dove through a few more rabbit holes and and started meeting other people who felt this way and getting into really interesting discussions that just kind of lit me up and uh, yeah so that's kind of like the short the short story of how that's, that's a short story <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Murray Rothbard is the the gateway drug for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me too. He. Uh, I think I, with me it was a creature from Jekyll Island, um, and then uh, yeah, Murray Rothbard, Anatomy of the State, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money, um, mm -hmm. and the Case for the Hundred Percent Gold Dollar. And it's and it's and it's so awesome that those things are free on Mises.org, right? Like, yeah. Like you know how how much would you know this kind the spread of knowledge would have been retarded if if it was not free right and yeah. if you had to pay for it and it was like under lock and key you know so so yeah that's such a wonderful resource for people definitely um but that's a yeah it's an awesome awesome journey i mean um peaceful parenting is something that uh i think can really change the world you know peaceful parenting and unschooling you know it's like yeah. treating kids with respect like what a revolutionary concept <laughs> yeah. and, and kindness right yeah it's like my kid is not my property right mm -hmm. or my subject you know and i can't do what i want to him i don't have that right right even though i'm bigger older and stronger you know still he has rights of his own he has self-ownership because he's a he living breathing human being right with passions and desires and needs and yeah. we have to respect that right so yeah awesome stuff um so so how do you how do you um you know uh explain to people about like people that you meet on the street like or you know occasionally uh, casually you know do, do you bring up these topics with with those people or um, like, how, how do you introduce it I, I don't intentionally like proselytize my my beliefs you know I uh -huh. I wait until people get curious about what I'm doing and then they they ask me because um, I think that's a big part of kind of the unschooling approach with my children is that I'm not trying to go and and teach them something they don't want to learn right. and um, we all know how that feels I think to be told mm -hmm. how to do something that you weren't really interested in learning how to do um, mm -hmm. or maybe you already know how to do it, it kind of um, in a subtle way expresses like, I don't totally trust you to figure this out on your own because maybe you're not intelligent enough or whatever. People, and, and obviously most people don't actually mean 
in that. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of my philosophy. So when people ask me about my life and they find out that I have kids and um, people ask what grade they're in and I say, oh, you know, we don't do grades. And and they'll be like, what? You know, and I'll, I'll say, well, I, uh, I'll say we educate at home or we, we follow an inquiry-based model or uh, we're life learners. Um, and then they might ask what my typical day looks like, which that's a really challenging <laughs> question to answer in and of itself because every day is so different. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of my approach in the same with volunteerism. At one point, I was a more um, outspoken kind of advocate for that perspective, but I found that um, doing it that way turned a lot more people off than I, than I wanted to be turning off. And it was, it was kind of like already speaking to people who already agreed with me um and there might have been like one or two you know a handful of people who were like oh that makes sense and then changed their mind but uh, the most uh connection that i've gotten over conversations about these ideas have been one where someone has come and asked me just because they're curious and they want to understand already on their own yeah yeah indeed <clears throat> um yeah, yeah, I do a fair amount of writing in my videos and, and my podcasts and everything. And it's true, you know, when you become more and more outspoken, you know, you you do run the risk of alienating some people, you know, perhaps some friends that you used to have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. It definitely is a uh, something that you have to be uh, cognizant of. Um, so so let's let's talk about your your website. So uh, so would you say that that's related to volunteerism and, and unschooling? What you oh, do? my gosh, yes. Everything I do is all related. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> yeah, so I discovered nonviolent communication through a friend of mine, Wes Bertrand. You may be familiar with him. He does a Complete Liberty podcast. He's written a couple of books. Um, and I, I just – it. It was another kind of John Holt moment for me when I found the work of Marshall Rosenberg that he had articulated something so clearly that made so much sense. I could see that this applied if everybody knew how to practice nonviolent communication within themselves and, and with their interpersonal relationships, that the government would dissolve because the belief that I have an authority over another person would just be so... Um, it wouldn't meet my needs for consideration, for respect, for contribution, um, you know, for care, for for all of that, for nonviolence, for peace, mm -hmm. and um, and so this is just another avenue to really get get clear about the nature of some of these social um, institutions, like like government, like schools, like religion, um, and and so yeah, and and for me, I believe that. All of those social institutions are a reflection of kind of our own individual brain software, if you will. Like, uh, the government would exist if we didn't believe that it was, uh, you know, a viable strategy to get our needs met and that it, that it somehow made sense. And while you and I might kind of see through that, the majority of people don't. And so the institution is there. But if people understood um, kind of the nature of it, it would... It would disappear. Nobody would want to participate in it anymore because it would be against their values, right? So NVC is one way of getting uh, a lot of clarity um, within yourself about your own motivations, your own needs, and also seeing what you have in common with other people in your life and how to communicate that clearly and also to hear what their what their needs are and their perspectives are um, in a really clear way and to, to hear that. So it's, it's a way of creating more connection in your life, however much connection you want. And um, yeah, I think this is kind of a way to to upgrade our brain software to transcend I, uh, ideas like these domination hierarchies that we have in our society. Um, yeah, you, you reminded me um, when you were talking about you know government disappearing. Um, I forget who said it, but uh, the quote is, um, you know, if if the if the violence or the guns were removed from government, um, all that would be left of it would be it would look like you know just a failed business with a crappy product. <laughs> that nobody wants to buy. <laughs> yeah, essentially. You know? I mean, the government does uh, attempt to provide services and products that people need and want, but they do it in a way that is inefficient and and also is based on 
stealing property from other people and using it how they think that it ought to be used instead of allowing people the freedom to, to make those choices on their own. Actual win-win ways, which is also uh, a big el element of nonviolent communication. is It's all about finding win-win strategies to meet our needs without anybody sacrificing oneself to the other. Yeah. And so the idea is to only ever do anything that you want to do, um, only ever do anything from the, the same joy as a child feeding a hungry duck. That's a quote from Marshall Rosenberg. And um, hmm. I imagine if people were able to live by that, it would be a much different place. So Right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, talking about democracy. I'm reading a book now called Beyond Democracy by with by uh, Frank Karsten. And it's funny, he's like, well, when, when you... Um, complain or criticize about democracies you know most people think so what do you want a, a dictatorship <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like that's the only you know pull up like like so so if if everybody doesn't draw a consensus and vote on what we should eat and then we all eat the same thing you think one guy should decide what everyone should eat <laughs> of course we're like no decide for yourself what you want to eat <laughs> you know yeah so it's people have this uh, it's called the false dichotomy right if it's not this it's that black and white right there's no in between no gray areas absolutely that's another element of nonviolent communication i see a parallel with um to to just exactly what you're saying is that um so often we're focused on uh one way to fulfill our needs, to get our needs met, one strategy. It's either this or nothing, or mm. it's this situation that I really like or this situation that I really don't like, right? Mm -hmm. And in reality, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of ways for us to meet our needs, thousands of strategies. If we can um, stop focusing on the strategy itself as a need, and that's kind of where people get, get tangled up. For instance, um, I have to have a house to, to be happy. Mm. Um, I, I might need shelter, but does it have to be uh, a mansion on, you know, in Martha's Vineyard or, uh, <laughs> you know, like there's there's so many different ways of finding shelter. It doesn't need to be just one way. And uh, yeah. yeah. And so people get into conflict over this as well. Like we should do this with these resources. No, we should do this with these resources. And instead of seeing that there's many different ways to solve these problems that we have with one another. Cool. So. Can you can you give me some examples? And so you gave me one. Can you give me a few more, like how you apply nonviolent communication in your life? Oh maybe, wow! Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe with your kids? Yeah, I can think of uh, I can think of lots of of different ways. Um, essentially, my approach to conflict, which is inevitable in human life, like my kids get into little spats and and uh, conflicts or disagreements. And uh, what I'm doing as a parent is I'm looking for needs. And so in nonviolent communication, needs are universal. All humans have the same set of needs. And this is what connects all of us. This is what we have in common. And this is where we can and get connection. And our feelings arise as a result of these needs either being fulfilled or unfulfilled or uh, based on the metness of those needs. So you might feel sad, frustrated, or angry if your needs aren't satisfied in the way that you'd like or happy and excited and, and joyful, um, celebratory or whatever when your needs are fulfilled. So I'm look I'm observing the the feelings in my children and looking for the underlying needs. And if I can get clarity in what their needs are, I can find what strategies that we can use to meet those needs. And it might be, you know, they have one preference, they want to play with this one toy, they both want to. Um, and what they really want is fun and play. Those are their needs. And it doesn't need to just be with this one toy. We can find other activities, other things to do that also meet our needs for fun, play, engagement. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview of what I might do. I could give you maybe a more specific situation if you would like. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, let me just think of something. Uh, or in my own personal relationships, like I mentioned that I'm divorced, I'm a single mom, and uh, I learned nonviolent communication actually before I, I decided to get divorced, and I applied it to, um, you know, my life and did an assessment of what my needs were and realized that they were pervasively unmet and that I learned how to articulate this and that my needs matter and they're important and so were my husband's and that we could find ways to meet our needs that worked for both of us. And... Um, 
and it turned out that we had different preferences around strategies to meet our needs and our values weren't in alignment and I got a lot of clarity around this. I chose to do that relationship because it wasn't enriching my life and I wasn't um, excited and happy to be there and neither was he. So that kind of was like a huge, what some people might view as like a negative um, thing that happened, which for me has brought me a lot more freedom and, and happiness and fulfillment and self-connection cool so so any other um any other examples you can think of yeah yeah so um with with my kids uh, in particular uh, my youngest who's four now but you know a couple of years ago one thing that i picked up from maria montessori was to use like real tools and real um real glasses real dishes and and furniture that fit their children's bodies because they want to participate in the world in a real way and not just pretend right so yeah. um so one of the things i did was to use glass drinking glasses with my children and not uh, give them plastic which um requires a bit more awareness and observation and mm -hmm. also to uh you know um they need to develop skills to handle that in a way that works and not break it on the floor so so that, you know, spills whatever all over. And, of course, <laughs> this is part of the process, though, is dropping the glass and breaking it as part of the process of learning to hold a glass and exactly. pay attention, to be yeah. aware of your body. Exactly. And um, and so initially when I first started this, you know, I was, I was pretty excited to – I was really in touch with my underlying needs for doing this. Like I wanted them to learn – in a way that made sense and um but over time and enough broken glasses and enough stress <laughs> in my life the broken glass was not very fun when i found it on the floor right so i would i would get angry or upset and i would react and say like oh my gosh you know now we've got to clean this up and we're just about to leave and get out the door mm -hmm. and i don't want to deal with this right now and you know like really just communicate that in my body language my tone of voice mm -hmm. and my kids started to, feel, and this is even though I value peaceful parenting, right? Like I would get triggered and, mm -hmm. and this comes up like it's difficult to kind of change the habit and, and what was done to us as kids. Sure. And um, so, so yeah, one day I walked into the kitchen and I saw that there was a broken glass and nobody had come and told me about it. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me like why that was, that they were afraid to tell me that this had happened because they didn't want to see my reaction to this mm. they didn't want me to be disappointed or upset about it and i felt so so sad about that because i don't want to lose connection with my kids i want them to feel safe to come and tell me anything you know mm -hmm. especially something as small as a broken glass mm -hmm. and i realized that i had been reacting to this and um it was something i was already you know somewhat aware of but this really just hit me and um so i went and found my daughter and i said i noticed that there's broken glass on the floor this is part of NBC is to make a clear observation without any evaluations or interpretations or judgments of the situation. Like mm -hmm. you were a slob or you were careless and you made a huge mess that would mm -hmm. be filled with my own judgments and interpretations of what happened. Yeah, but yeah. my observation is I noticed that there's a broken glass on the floor and I'm curious if nobody came and told me because they felt scared. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, you know, so I connected to the feeling that they were afraid at that, at that moment. And I, I said, okay, I understand, you know, maybe in the past, like mommy has reacted to this and, um, and I'm really sad to hear that because I want you to feel safe and to be able to trust that what, um, what you tell me I'm going to be okay with no matter what. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they were like, okay, yeah. So, and in that moment, I felt a lot more connection to my daughter, and that we kind of started to rebuild this bridge to the um, connection and trust that had been eroded from my my re my reaction. Um, and so, I just matter of factly cleaned up the glass, made sure that the area was safe, and um, and then I was more mindful the next time something was spilled or broken that. I paused and stopped before I said anything and before I did anything and I took a deep breath and I checked in with myself how I was feeling and um, usually like the first thing might have been like a flush of frustration or anger um, or overwhelm even depending on what's going on in my day that day you know I'm juggling a lot and uh, and then it's because I'm having judgment thoughts like they should be more 
care for at odds with reality, right? And um, and so I just observe my thoughts about it and don't necessarily believe them as being true and connect with the feelings underneath that, which is just frustration and sadness. I want I want ease, you know. I want I want things to go with. I want. Yeah, I want ease. I want things to go um, in a way that is simple and, and neat and not uncomplicated. And that's not reality with three children at home. It's just mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so my need for order comes up, and and that's a big one with kids too. Is uh, yeah, is order. So I just get connected to my feelings and my needs underneath that, and then I also get connected to my deeper underlying need, which is connection with my kids. And that's the most important thing I don't want to lose. Mm -hmm. And when I'm grounded in that need, my response to the situation totally transforms from one of being frustrated or angry or impatient, um, overwhelmed, to, to one of care, you know, and concern mm -hmm. and wanting them to be safe and just also to teach them that it's not a big deal if something spills. Like, this is just something we can deal with that, no problem. Mm -hmm. Um and so over time, as I've brought more awareness to myself and the way that I respond to these different situations like broken glasses or, you know, somebody gets into the flower and it's like all over the, I'm sure you've seen pictures on the internet, kids get into stuff and make big messes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as I've gotten more aware and connected to myself, then I've noticed a connection between my, me and my children has um, improved and maintained so my my oldest child is almost 10 and he comes to me and tells me everything that he's thinking about you know like the big problems that he's got with his friends and concerns he has about like death and human sexuality and <laughs> you know like existence and all of that <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> nice yeah and um and i really feel just like a lot of trust and and um and it's just made my life so much more wonderful to have that tool to fall back on and that, that lens to look through, that clear, that clear way of connecting to myself and what's motivating me and my behaviors and also what's motivating other people and their behaviors and to find a common ground and to be able to, to communicate and get on the same page together. So You said so many great things that I want to talk about. I'm probably going to forget <laughs> some of them. But <laughs> um, the first one I want to say is, when I talk to people about parenting, I say that um, parenting is like a triangle and, um, you know, you have three corners and you can only have two, right? You have three corners and <laughs> one is uh, a clean house. One is like um, happy kids. Happy kids. <laughs> and, and your sanity. You heard this one? You heard this no, one? No, but I'm just guessing, you know, I'm a mom. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Clean house, happy kids and your sanity. And you can only yeah, have yeah. Th two. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah you're right like and, and my wife she she usually tells people that um you know when you have kids uh you should automatically assume 50 percent of your property will be destroyed <laughs> you know and and you shouldn't go crazy about it because yeah kids are kids they that's how they learn they fall they they you know scrape their knees they uh you know they fall off their bikes they um you know they break glass they do they make messes and 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 it's not because they're malicious or spiteful or you know um you know trying to make us angry they're just trying yeah. to learn about the world yes. and to get angry at them and even worse to hit them is just to complicate matters and just yeah. add layers of confusion you know and yeah. uh, trauma <laughs> to, yeah. to somebody who's just trying to learn about the world you know it's, they're, they're just you know they just got here <laughs> yeah you in know? our modern society and western cultures like uh the only, I think, kind of manifestation of this systematic distrust of children. If you look at other places in the world, it's not like just assumed that children are trying to manipulate us or trying to cause us trouble mm -hmm. or can't be trusted to, to learn and to do, you know, real things successfully by trial and error and, and using the scientific method. And... Um, yeah, and a lot of it is just the intergenerational transfer of what was done to 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 the parent, to the mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. and then from that child to their child, and so on and so on. And um, without bringing awareness and uh, really conscious effort in healing your own kind of mm -hmm. pains and things that happened to you as a kid, it's almost impossible to change. So, 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, the appeal to antiquity, you know, you know, we have to do we have to do exactly what our parents because it has been done like this for many, many generations. And uh, and it's also the cycle of violence, right? So unschoolers and peaceful parenters and you know, attachment parenters, they are breaking the cycle of violence in the family unit. And that's awesome, you know, because you know, it's a vicious cycle. And once it's broken, you know, it doesn't have to be broken again. It's just, it, 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 you know, the children don't have to learn or they don't have to heal from their um, traumatic experience at government school because they never experienced it, right? So, yeah. so it, just, it just propagates a, um, a feeling of, you know, peace and kindness and compassion and things like that. Um, yeah. But um, the other thing I wanted to say is... Um, you know, you were talking about how you get angry, and um, yeah, <laughs> I I feel that too. You know, and my wife too, and she she calms me down. You know, and I I calm her down a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, it's and I think I think you're right. I think that uh, is remnants of our past and how we were raised and you know you see your parents and and how they acted when you know things went wrong and you're like all right that must be normal that's how you act right (laughs) but now now with you you're changing that pattern and your kids you're teaching your kids no there's a different way that you can act when things go wrong and it doesn't have to be with anger and frustration and you know uh, resentment and all these all these negative emotions that just cause more pain right you can you can actually you know it can be calm and collected and you know talk with with soft tones and and it's just so hard and uh but i i i I try you know as much as possible to do it all the time so yeah it's so important to just calm down (laughs) so yeah and it you know it's really hard it is really hard and i want to be totally transparent about that like i'm not a perfect parent i definitely have ideals and and principles that i strive to live by and values that i really want my actions to be in alignment with Mm -hmm. but that doesn't always happen and Mm -hmm. um I don't think a lot of people talk about that in the attachment or peaceful parenting communities. I think uh, there can be a lot of judgment slung at each other and all of this. And uh, I would really love to see that change and more transparency be brought to like the challenges that, that people face and um, yeah, shifting paradigms and, and breaking out of how we've been programmed to interact with one another, you know, and the habit, the decades of habit of, of um, you know, uh, think about how much time you spend in school. And how, you know, a, a decade or so in, or almost two decades in a family unit and how much time you're, you're picking up and absorbing what happens and that social structure and what that does to your brain and your neural networks and how it takes, it takes time and consciousness to, to do something different and to build new networks in your mind so that it's easier to respond with compassion and patience and self-connection and um, in a calm way. And, uh, yeah, but it's totally possible. And I, and I really, um, for me personally, nonviolent communication has been, uh, an awesome tool, an awesome set of skills, an awesome lens to look through. That's really made this much easier. And, um, and the more I practice it, the, the easier it gets, the more wonderful my life gets. And, um, and yeah, my behaviors are more in alignment with my values. My family is more connected and happier. And uh, it is possible. It is possible. Even though some days are hard and sometimes it doesn't all go perfectly, uh, you can always go back also after something like that and talk to your kids about it and um, be honest about how hard it is to, to, you know, not get upset and to maybe work together to find different strategies to to, uh, de-escalate things. So, Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that you reminded me of was... um when you said you know you don't want to destroy the bond with your children and Mm. you saw that 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 trust was going because they weren't communicating with you anymore right things are happening they weren't honest and uh you know that's so true it's like um you know when children grow up in an authoritarian environment um they're obedient and they comply with their parents not because not, not because they understand morality and they they want to you know um how do you say, like they have a conscience, but because they don't want to get hurt <laughs> or mm-hmm. punished, right? That's why yeah. they comply. And you don't want your kids to do things for fear of punishment, right? That's, not, that, not yet, buddy. 
<laughs> that's you know that's not you know that's not what you want because you know then they're you know they're not human beings anymore they're robots they're drones you know they're um and you don't want that that's that's really harmful for an individual um and so you know i i don't view my I, my children as my subjects or my property or anything like that you know or my or my inferior you know because that's exactly what authoritarian parenting um sets up and that that's kind of a precursor to sending them to government school which you know the authority figure is now the teacher right the principal yeah. right? and there's always an authority figure and you know you gotta ask for anything can i go to the bathroom can i do this can i do that yeah um and and so instead of that i talk to them as an equal as a peer like i'm a friend i'm not your superior that you just have to listen to me because i said so like like you know um you can disagree <laughs> you know we'll talk yeah. we'll talk about it we'll discuss things let's have conversations you know um and it's so important to establish that connection because you're right like you want them to view you as an advisor that they would want to come to for advice like yes. like not that they're forced to because you're older and stronger no but that they want because they value your advice and they see that it's useful and effective that's what you they that's what you want them or me anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's kind of the idea of authority through coercion mm. and force and then mm. the authority, like the legitimate authority because you have wisdom, experience, and they can trust you. Mm. And um, they they know that you're not going to tell them what they should or shouldn't do uh, disconnected from what, what they're wanting for mm. their own lives. And yeah, and um, I know I've heard this, I can't remember the source, but just to treat your child as you would like your neighbor or a friend mm, and yeah. um, not, and that's not to say not to have healthy boundaries, right? But, um, but you wouldn't yell at your neighbor for dropping a glass on your floor, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that wouldn't make right. sense. If you were a guest in my home, I wouldn't yell at you about that. Right, right, so right. Uh, just to keep that in mind, yeah, that these are actual human beings with mm -hmm. feelings and needs just like us. And they're just a little bit, uh, you know, behind developmentally, but they're catching up quickly and they're learning everything through what we model for them, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what they're learning is how you behave and, and, and um, what you do and what you say, they pick up m more from what you do than what you say is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can right. tell them, you know, to do something all day long, but if they see you doing something else, that's, you know, that's confusing, mm -hmm. I think. Big time. Cognitive dissonance. You're right. Yeah. And, and I try so hard, um, you know, if I see something that, that my son is doing or my daughter is doing and I don't necessarily approve of it, but um, still, like, I don't, I, I like I try as little as possible to assert the fact that I'm the father, you know, like mm -hmm. like you said, like I I, I don't want to assert that. I don't want to say don't do that, you know, unless you know they're yeah. playing with knives or something like that. But yeah. for the most part, as much as possible, you know, give them freedom to do what they want, right, and yeah. explore and have fun, and um, you know, just just you know, learn through play, right? That's exactly what, what uh, you know, I understand unschooling to be, right? It's a play-based learning. It's child-driven education. It's, um, you know, whatever the child is interested in, that's what they're going to be learning. Like, I saw a great, a great meme. Of, you see a kid, a kid painting with his fingers, finger painting, and it says, um, there's no such thing as just playing. This is how I learn. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think right. John Holt John Holt pointed out that, you know, learning begins the day of birth or even in the womb. And yeah, right, uh, the womb. <laughs> right after I said that I realized like, yeah, you could have maybe said that a bit earlier. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Might just tweak that a bit. But uh, <laughs> improve it. But but that yeah, that human beings are natural scientists. They use a scientific mm. method and they're they're insanely curious. Like this curiosity is as much of a drive as hunger, mm. as thirst, mm. as as for like physical content contact with another human being like they want to understand how the world works why things are the way they are if you spend time with kids all they do is ask thousands of questions yeah and and do experiments with the physical world mm. until someone comes along and interrupts that and decides that they know better what mm. they ought to be learning and it right. and it's this according to somebody else's arbitrary standards that have nothing to do with right. their actual exactly. life or what maybe they even want to be doing exactly. doesn't make any sense and a, a couple of things that you were saying brought up two concepts for me in NBC, which is power with versus power over. Mm -hmm. And so the the 
typical public school education system and also parenting model are more of a power over approach, like um, doing things to people instead of with them through support and guidance, care, respect, giving them the information and the reasons why we do things. And also another which is of course, and um, sometimes it is necessary that we use our bigness and our strength and our experience and our wisdom uh, to protect our kids from hurting themselves, mm. maybe from running out in the street or touching a hot stove, two classic examples, yeah. um, or from hurting another sibling. Mm -hmm. uh, I can think of all kinds of things versus, you know, spanking the kid for doing something that you didn't like, using the punitive use of force for punishing them because they were bad and wrong and they should have been good. So just two different aspects of, or two different approaches, I think. One is more in alignment with uh, what I'm after, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. When I when I tell people about, you know, unschooling and I make posts on Facebook and, you know, talk about freedom and let kids explore and everything and, and no spanking and they're like, so you would let your kids run in the street? <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 amazing like uh it's like either you spank them or you let them run in the street that you, you have to choose <laughs> which one yeah again with one. that false dichotomy right, <laughs> right. it's either or yeah. but that's not true <laughs> yeah 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 exactly yeah, yeah cuz we that's how that's how most people have been brought up you know it's like yeah. i was spanked and i turned out okay <laughs> and like yeah. well i would debate that <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty tragic to hear people saying that, you know, and uh, I would I would love to see more of the population kind of have more ease in considering alternative approaches to, to relating with one another. And um, yeah, I just find it pretty disheartening and sad that that's not the case. A lot of people get pretty upset when they hear these ideas because they're really different and maybe it's mm. painful to think that something like this happened to them and it wasn't mm. okay. They don't want to. They don't want to think about it. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, and the other thing is um, that you know, if you just look at it from like um, a, a standpoint of exertion, um, mm -hmm. the authoritarian parenting and then sending them to government school—that's the easy way of parenting. Yeah. That's the lazy way of parenting. You don't have to do much. You just send them there. The teacher will take care of them. They're gonna be fine, you know. <laughs> or authoritarian parenting: do what I do as I say, and that's it. Case closed. No yeah. conversation, no debate, you know. Forget about what the kid wants, right? That's it. But when you actually open a dialogue, you know, that's difficult because then you have to yeah. be engaged, right? You have to uh. find you have to find solutions and you gotta figure out a problem and how do we do this and you know, um, and and that's awesome. I love that. I mean, it's, it's, and it's so sad. You know, you were talking about the, the, the questioning when kids, you know, start with the barrage of questioning. And so many times I hear parents say, oh, my, it's so annoying. My kids ask yeah. all these questions. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about annoying? He's learning. That's how he's learning. And you yeah. just, you're just shutting him off or you can't wait to, until he stops. And yeah. it and it's so sad. And then and then they're gonna they're gonna figure out or get the message that, you know, if they want to figure something out, they shouldn't go to you, you know? Yeah. Because you don't have anything to respond with because you're just bored of their questions, you know. It's, yeah, or even that curiosity is something that isn't isn't welcome, you right. know, that it's yeah. not cool to ask questions. Right. And uh and that in itself is really tragic. So I mean, and I can I can empathize with the parents who get kind of tired of, <laughs> of the incessant questions, but but I do personally get pretty excited about that. You know, like I love to see what they're curious about, and and um, like they think about things in a totally fresh way that I I might have forgotten about. You know, like before I I thought I knew what <laughs> what things mm. were, and they they help me to realize what I don't actually know. You mm. know, and if I don't know, I I don't just say I don't know. I say I don't know. Let's go find out. Yeah. And Exactly. And show them the tools to kind of uncover these things and answer the questions that they have. Or let's go talk to somebody who does know about this. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm honest about my infallibility and that I don't know everything and that humans don't know everything either. You know, like there are some things that humanity just doesn't have figured out yet. And that's really exciting too because you could be the person to figure that out. You know, you ha you're asking the question, that could be your thing, you know. And... Uh, and it's pretty cool. Like today, my daughter Ella was asking about um, whether or not scientists could make some some sort of uh, 
body modification so that you could fly and and i said well i don't think they have you know s- <laughs> some way to augment your body to do that yet uh-huh. but maybe you could be the person to figure that out and she's like wow. i don't know i don't know if i want to be a scientist or not and i was like well you could be the person to hire the scientist to figure that out you know like and she was right. really digging that idea <laughs> so that's awesome yeah 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 it's so cool uh, it's, it's uh, okay so- yeah, question go ahead say, say again Oh, I get I get big questions like what uh you know where did the first human being come from Ooh, and nice. um <laughs> what happens after I die and and just concepts of time like yesterday tomorrow and today like mm. is it tomorrow now and like still trying to figure that out you know and it's right, it's right, cool right. I enjoy that that right. they're they're just trying to yeah they want to understand the world and be really effective and participate fully and it just like we do they want to do what we're doing yeah. and uh yeah it's really exciting <laughs> i yeah. think so yeah you know uh okay you're saying such beautiful things i'm, I'm almost gonna cry <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but but yeah it's like like for me i play I'm, I'm a chess player and a piano player and i've been you know loving those things like my, like my passion since i was 12 years old and um and my wife she's always telling me you should teach the kids chess and piano yeah. So what do you what do you think I said to that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I I play chess a lot. Like they see me, you know, we go to parks yeah. and I bring my chess set and I play with other people. Um, and I play piano on the weekends occasionally, and they see that. Mm-hmm. And if they, you know, they come sometimes they bang on the piano keys, and that's fine. And I'm like, well, if they ask, if they want to, they're gonna ask me to teach them. And that's fine. But, you know, for me to sit them down and say, now we're going to learn piano, <laughs> you know, that's that's a complete turnoff, complete deterrent. And I think it's counterproductive, you know, and when they're ready, when they really want to, they're going to ask me and they're going to want to learn and they're going to be awesome at it. So, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And this is the other thing I want to tell you is, is it's it's like as as parents, you know, I think a lot of parents are like this. Um, you know, we all have our desire or let's say our interests and our hobbies and our belief systems, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm chess and piano and you're nonviolent communication and, you know, volunteers and, and all this kind of stuff. And what we would love is for our kids to be like us. Most people, sure. I think, right? We would love, like you would love your kids to do nonviolent communication. I would love my kids to do chess and piano. And that's the problem. <laughs> We're always trying to impose our beliefs onto our kids. But you have to ask the question, well, what do they want? <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. they don't want to do a nonviolent. Maybe they don't want to uh, like do that as a job. Maybe like, you know, yeah. as a career. Like maybe they want to do something else. And mm. that's fine. Like that, that, that's, that's completely fine. They, they have their own lives. So I think yeah. that's something that most parents have to realize is that, you know, we all want to impose what we think is important. Like my grandfather, he's he's like PhD in physics. So what do you think he wants to teach kids? Physics and mathematics. What do you, what do you think he what do you think he thinks is important for kids to learn? <laughs> not piano. <laughs> not piano, right? So he's like <laughs> mathematics is not. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So what do you think about like? Have you met parents like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I've met parents like that. I've met children who who have grown up into adults to, to, to do what their parents did because they were taught that, you know, right, like, right, right, right. like, uh, yeah. I'm going to be a pilot just like dad is a yeah. pilot. And then they totally follow their parents' life path and they end up miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they end up like having some career change in the middle of their life. And, yeah, yeah. um, yeah, you know, and as far as like with me and nonviolent communication, I've never taught my kids anything formally about mm. NVC, mm. but I practice it with them and I model it. That's and the most I, important. That's the most important. Yes, part, and yeah. I see them practicing it with each other and with me, and I've never taught them That's awesome. ever. That's awesome. You know, yeah, like the other day, um, we went to the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest in Delton, Michigan, which is a voluntarist uh, Ooh, event. I'm jealous. Yeah, it was jealous. it was awesome. We <laughs> camped with like a bunch of other families, other unschoolers. Uh, you make parents. Me feel dumb, man. <laughs> yeah, it was Sounds great. Cool. Um, <laughs> and now I totally forgot what. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> you went to the Michigan thing and you camped out and. Yeah. Oh, oh, the modeling and and yeah, my son Noah. Um, 
he was doing NBC with his sister who was kind of frustrated because she there were a lot of kids there mm. and and it wasn't really clear like whose property was whose because we were all kind of in this orchard and lots of tents and so right. kids were coming into our space mm. and she wanted to have some space just by herself you know mm. she wanted to hang out in her hammock and not have anyone be talking to her or touching her yeah. and that wasn't going on and so she was getting upset and my son Noah said to Ella like oh, Ella, do you really just want some space right now just to be left alone and not to have these kids around? And, <laughs> and she was like, yeah. And and just that sentence right there is something that I would have said to her and that I have said to him, like guessing what their feelings and their needs are. Like you, you just want some space. Because I know that it's yeah. true. They learn what you do. And that's why it's so important to work on yourself and don't worry about working on your kids. The mm. more that you focus on yourself mm. and uh, getting really clear on what you want in life and being successful at that, they'll learn that, they'll pick that up, and they'll reflect that. They're kind of like little mirrors. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, so that's what I was yeah, I'm yeah. happy that I remembered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's so true. Like, like if, if I really wanted to teach my kids chess and piano, I should play so much piano and so much and and do so much chess and show them that I love to do it, right? Yeah. And if they really want to learn it, then they're going to want to learn it because they can see how much I love to do it. That's the perfect way to uh, you know instill things, instill the love of doing things, right? And yeah, uh, yeah that's that's really it's really so important that uh, you know I think um, uh, I was talking to this other woman I, I interviewed who's an unschooler and she was saying that. Um, you know, teaching kids to do things for the value of doing them, not because they're mm -hmm. going to get a reward, right? Yeah. Or a punishment. <laughs> and the and whole what intrinsic motivation, right? Right, 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 right. And she was, and one of the things that she was saying was um, that she doesn't give her kids chores, <clears throat> which, um, which uh, kind of uh, you know is revolting to a lot of parents, <laughs> a lot of you know authoritarian parents, uh, because that's what most people, most kids are raised with. It's chores, you know. You just got to do stuff that you don't like, but you know some things, some things in life you're not going to enjoy doing, and you just got to do it. And, and actually, that's I heard that explanation for public school as well. You know, not all things in life are fun. Some things you just have to do. <laughs> Yeah, that's a whole nother concept in NBC. I'll keep drawing parallels. Awesome. <laughs> that, um, yeah, d that people learn that they t t to do things because they should and because mm -hmm. they have to mm -hmm. and not because they want to and because they're meeting their own needs through mm -hmm. doing so. And that's exactly what, what you just said. You know, like um, it's all about finding that intrinsic motivation and do things that, that – you're inspired and excited to be doing and you'll naturally be really productive and you'll naturally learn a lot doing those things and another thing is your child might see you like totally dedicated and committed to playing the piano and loving it and just be passionate about it and they might not ever pick up the piano but they will observe you doing something that you love and that really enriches your life and that's super exciting and awesome to you and they'll find that thing and have that same energy and that same uh, yeah, that same sense of life around what they do. And that's what it's all about. It's not like being exactly a little mini clones. It's a, yeah, about, <laughs> about their, their, what's their inner motivation? Like, why are they doing what they're doing? I want my kids to be happy, you know? I want them to be excited to be alive and not just, you know, yeah, life has to suck. No, it doesn't. It can be awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Life just sucks. What are you going to do, you know? <laughs> and my, my grandfather, he, uh, I remember he said, um, and you know, he's not too uh, keen on uh, homeschooling. Forget, never mind, unschooling. <laughs> yeah. But um, but uh, one question he asked uh, is, um, what do you what do you want your kids to be? <laughs> don't don't you want your kids to have a successful job? You know, Doctors a nice lawyers, house, of <laughs> a nice house and a nice car. Don't you want that? And and I said, no, I want them to be happy. That's all. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. It doesn't matter what they're doing, what house they have, what car they have. If they're not happy, then that's not good. <laughs> you know, that's not a success in my book, you know, yeah. because if you're not happy with what you're doing, that's that's to me, that's akin to failure. <laughs> Forget yeah. about monetary gain and, you know, wealth and and assets and things like that. If, if you're not feeling spiritually fulfilled, um, you're on the wrong path. <laughs> that's the yeah. way. Mm. So, yeah, you, you say so you. um. You encounter, you get that question too. Like, what do you, what do you want your kids to be? <laughs> People ask. Um, 
I, you know what? I have never been asked that actually, but people will ask my kids what they want to be ah, okay. when they grow up, yeah. which I think is kind of a funny question because, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, like, and who says that you can only be one thing and you right. have to choose and you have to choose it now, right, you know? Right, right. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and my kids kind of like scratch their heads at that. Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, like they're not thinking about that. They're in the moment what's relevant to their lives today. Right. And, um, as they get more exposure to the world and different people and different things, they'll discover that in their own time, and and it'll happen. And I trust that, so I'm not I'm not stressed when they don't have an answer. And that question to me kind of assumes that kids are incomplete. And, yeah, you know, it's like they're lacking in something. You know, you you're, you're not grown up yet, but you're gonna be grown up. And so, what are you gonna be? And like you said, you have to choose one thing. And like, oh man, this is so stressful. I can only choose one thing. <laughs> No, what am I going to do? What if I choose the wrong thing? <laughs> yeah, and that and that life is kind of like, oh, you'll you'll go through school, you graduate, find a, you know, a life partner, have kids and right. the whole like that's right. the story that people have been told for a long time that that's a happy successful life. And I think a lot of people have lived that and discovered that that's not actually the case, you know. Um yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, you know, they, they, you know, they have their job, the four hundred one k, and then they retire. And then they <laughs> I, I, I was talking to this one woman, and she was saying, you know, and then the, then the man is like fishing on his boat when his retirement. He's thinking, you know what? What did I do? <laughs> I could have done this, you know, I could have done this fishing a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And instead, I devoted my life to pleasing, satisfying other people or culture or what society mm. expects of me or my family yes. ex- expects of me. You know. And it's constantly, constantly, you know, seeking approval or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I also get a lot of times I'll get uh, people quizzing my children, which I think is <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah. Like, oh, oh you're sad. homeschooled. That's so sad. like, like, do you know, four plus four <laughs> and my son will be there like rolling his eyes like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Um, and that's another thing, John Holt. He's like one of my favorite guys, um, <laughs> so I'll keep quoting him. Sure, he sure. talks about the the difference between a quiz question and an actual question. Uh-huh. And um, like an example of this would be, say, I'm in Manhattan and I'm like, hey, how do I get to 26th and 5th? I don't actually know at that point. And I'm thinking that you have the answer, mm-hmm. right? And I'm hoping that you do and that you can tell me and I'll benefit from this and then mm-hmm. I can move on. Right. Whereas if I did know how to get to 26th and 5th, I, <laughs> why would I be asking you yeah. to test you, you and just, see if you knew? Because I think it. that maybe you don't and you should. Ooh. And it's like I don't totally trust that you know what you need to know and that you're capable of finding out what you need to find out when you need to find it out. And um, and so, yeah, I get kind of bothered when this happens and uh, it's, it tends to be like family members who have teaching backgrounds or uh, acquaintances that kind of come from a, you know a different model, and I can also hear in that though that they really care and want to contribute to my children's success and make sure that they're okay, and um, and they're worried maybe a little bit because it's just different and they don't they haven't done the research and they haven't had the experiences that I have had and um, yeah it takes takes some trust. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Want, I don't want to keep you too long. I hear the uh, the kids are getting rowdy. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that um, yeah, that's a that's, that's a really good point. That uh, it's like again, pe- parents are measuring their kids or or other people's kids that are being homeschooled or unschooled. They're measuring them according to their own um, interests or hobbies or passions, you know, or knowledge that they gained. It's like it's like if I if it's like if I go up to somebody and I say, "Do you know how to play piano? Do you know how to play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata?" <laughs> Yeah, no, like what? what is wrong with you? <laughs> well, you should know. Well, you should. <laughs> I taught you that. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like it's like you know. I, I like to, I like to think about all of the bits of information that you know human beings have thought of, and the books that have been written, and the articles, and you know people talking, and philosophers, and all of that information, and we think that a certain fraction of a fraction of a percentage is important for everybody to know. Yeah. <laughs> who, who makes that choice? Who makes that determination? On, based on what? Like what authority do you have to determine that this information is what everybody should know, right? So. Yeah, it's entirely arbitrary. And, it's, and it's, learning isn't scalable. Like you can't, 
you can't really scale it up to work for the same 500 people because each person out of those 500 is an individual with their own preferences and styles and personalities and experiences and life contexts and and it's impossible to make something that's going to work for everybody mm. and uh, education doesn't need to be going through a factory like making thousands of crayons that all need to be identical and the same, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> we don't want everyone to be the same. There are different people with different strengths and talents that can do different things. And if they have the freedom to find out what that is and the, and the freedom, the resources to, to, to do it, then the world would be so much richer, so much vibrant, more vibrant and interesting, I think. And I'm excited. Uh, knowing that my, kids will have the other parents that I know that are brave enough to jump in there and do something totally different and against the grain despite criticism despite the challenges despite kind of yeah having to you know heal yourself and what was what happened to you to do something different and uh yeah I'm really hopeful that that is one path that can transform the culture that we live in is through through parenting and education in a, in a totally different way Excellent. So I assume you're a fan of uh, of the IQ test and SAT. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's see how you score in this arbitrary test, and then we're going to determine if you're intelligent or not. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the the uh, the, the cartoon of. Uh, you know, you see uh, like a goldfish, a uh, horse, yeah, yeah. and a, you know what, a monkey and uh, a squirrel <laughs> and a snail. Say, okay, now everyone climb this tree. And this is the test. Climb the tree. <laughs> right? And, yeah. Uh, right? Like, uh, like well, I think it was Einstein said, if you, if, you, if, you, um, if you tell a fish to ride a bicycle, it's going to spend the rest of its life thinking it's stupid. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, gosh. And this happens. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really tragic. Yeah, yeah. So awesome conversation. Um, so before we yeah. go, why don't you um, uh, just pl plug your, your, your websites again just, uh, just to let them know. Yeah, I'm with Metro Detroit Nonviolent Communication. That's at mdnvc.org or Metro Detroit Nonviolent Communication on Facebook. You can also find me on Facebook as Delilah DeClaire. Um, and I'm affiliated with the New York Center for Nonviolent Communication, NYCNVC. I do uh, facilitation and training uh, with them in New York and uh, beyond that. So uh, awesome. am I forgetting anything? I don't think so at this point. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and also your Facebook name, Delilah Declare, so that's not your real name. So um, right. can you just explain to them real quick uh, the significance of the of the, that name or the last name? Yeah, um, Declare is the last name of uh, I, I Want to Be Famous, a female anarchist from the 1800s. She was also from Michigan where I live. And um, yeah, she ultimately was an anarchist without labels, but she she was a prolific writer, just wrote really beautiful, insightful things about humanity and uh, was really an inspiring figure for me as um, libertarianism, anarchism tends to be pretty male-dominated mm. uh, little subculture. So it's just great. And I would love to, to see more people know about uh, her as Volterine Declare, uh, D-E-C-L-E-Y-R-E. -E. If you Google her, you can find uh, the wiki page. Her life is fascinating, the story of her life. And, um, you know, check out some of her writings and, and yeah, see what you think. Cool. So, uh, so before we go, just, um, can you give people uh, a message like for those parents that, you know, are interested in unschooling or homeschooling or, or are scared or, or also for those parents who are maybe who are on the fence about it, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? Um, I would say that in the beginning I was scared too. I, I had no idea if this was going to work, if I was just totally crazy. I was afraid of being accepted and having belonging with my friends and my family. And I was scared about getting the criticism from them and the acceptance from them and um, all of the different cultural expectations that we have. And also um, to trust myself to be able to handle being with my kids all the time and, um, and to be able to provide the resources for them to learn. And I found through experience that uh, it's it really has been one of the best choices I've ever made in my entire life. I get to be with my kids. I get to watch them learn and grow and develop over time. I get to have really powerful, meaningful relationships with them. And um, I've, I've, 
I've also gained a lot of self-trust through this process and a lot of self-knowledge and awareness about myself. Um, I've learned more than I ever did in, in public school uh, through unschooling, believe it or not. And a big part of the process was de-schooling myself and uh, challenging some of those beliefs that I adopted from the culture and from being in a school system, like that you have to be taught things and, and you need to know certain things by certain times. And this is, it's not true. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, like my, my son Noah learned how to read almost without any help. Like he was really motivated to do it on his own. Uh, and he was like four and a half or something like this. And I, that was one of the things I was really concerned about. Like, how can I teach a kid how to read, you know? Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to teach him. He just came to me with questions, and all I did was answer them. It's that simple. Exactly. Just answer the questions, provide them, accept them, and love them, and you'll be blown away. You won't regret it. <laughs> Beautiful. And also, it's it's not for everyone, too, you know? it's not It's not for everyone without support. You've got to be able to find support and have community. And fortunately, with the Internet, it's totally possible to – to connect with other people who are considering these other approaches. So seek those people out, get connected with them, develop a network so that, you know, even though you're doing something totally different than the culture around you, you're not alone no matter where you are. So, yeah, yeah, that's so important. Networking with people, you know, meeting other homeschoolers, on schoolers in the area, yeah, Facebook groups. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so important because it's easy to be isolated. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. not about, you know, some people think like I tell them homeschooling and like, wait, wait, so you just lock them in a room and you throw books at them and and what you give them food occasionally is that what you do <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i treat them like a prisoner <laughs> it's my hostage yeah so yeah a lot of uh no we... that's what happens when they go to school right? exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly so got a lot of uh a lot of education to do with ourselves and other people who are, you know, interested in uh, in trying this out. So awesome conversation, um, yeah. Katie. Thank you very much uh, for coming on the show. Um, so, so if anyone wants to um, donate, uh, do you, actually, do you receive any donations on your website? Do you have any, any options? I, I don't, you know, I'm, I might want to try that out yes, <laughs> if you're not? suggesting it. Yeah. Why not? You know, <laughs> if people want to help you out, you know, they, uh, they like your cause and, you know they want to support you through so through other means. You know, so yeah, why not? <laughs> don't turn don't turn it any any uh any avenues of uh, you know income <laughs> down. <laughs> but, You're right. Uh, I haven't explored all my possibilities here. What have I been doing? <laughs> see that? I'm, uh, see, we're learning right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if anybody wants to donate uh to me my show, um, you can do so through Bitcoin and PayPal. And uh, and also be um, uh, accepting Patreon quite soon. I just got to set up the account. I know I keep saying that I'm a procrastinator, but um, I need another guy. <laughs> they need someone else to do. I got so much stuff going. on. It's like personal it's like, assistant time. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, it's like I guess that's that's when you know you have to hire somebody, right? It's like yeah, and you're like I can't sleep anymore. I just have to do <laughs> stuff. You know, sleeping sleeping is just it's like it's so annoying. It's like you just gotta sleep, and it, it's that's time that you could have spent doing stuff, <laughs> doing I something feel you. valuable. I totally feel you, yeah. Right? <laughs> it's kind of Definitely. Funny. So all right, so I hear the kids asking questions. You know, they need she needs to get back to her unschooling. So. <laughs> so thank yeah. you very much katie awesome conversation uh thank really you. enjoyed it uh maybe thanks. we'll have you on again in the future to hear how you've been uh, any updates uh going on with you i'm sure there's always something new to talk about with the unschooling world oh uh, yeah <laughs> awesome so um so this is uh peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and uh, also the seeds of liberty.com and the conscious resistance.com. And there she has her anarchist cat right there on her lap. So very cool. <laughs> very fitting. <laughs> See that beautiful cat. What kind of cat is that? <laughs> I, I didn't hear oh, that. Did, did, you know what kind, what kind of cat that is? Oh, it's a Lynx Point Siamese. Wow. Very nice. Beautiful. Eyes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, beautiful. So thanks everyone for listening. So um, uh, have a great night. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.